Yeah, sure. Um, so firstly, I'm very happy to uh, be here if, if it's helpful and so on. Um, so yeah, so I left school uh, quite a while ago now. And um, essentially, I, I, I had considered medicine in school. Um, I was strongly encouraged by my family to consider it. Um, but I felt like it was something you needed to be very sure of. And I, it came to the application um, through UCAS and I, I just felt that I, I wasn't sure enough. So I decided to pursue um, my, my passion for science instead. And so I went and did a bachelor's degree in natural sciences um, where you can essentially pick um, some from some of the main sciences um, and have those as core streams. So I did biomedical science and organic chemistry. Um, I came out of that thinking, well, I went into that thinking I'd, I'd end up, you know, becoming a, a research scientist, but I, I realised that there, it wasn't as, um, I suppose, patient-centred as I had expected, and there was a lot of lab work and computer work, and that wasn't quite me. So, um, to be honest, I came out of my bachelor's not really knowing what to do next. Um, but I also had passion for sport, and there was a sports job um, in universities that had come up, so I decided to go for that. So I worked in university sport for a couple of years. Um, and it was during this time I was volunteering at a rugby sevens tournament and I uh, bumped into these pitch side medics and we got talking and they were like, well, why don't you, why don't you consider medicine again? Um, and I was, and I was around my mid twenties by this point and I thought, well, I suppose, I suppose I'll look into it again, actually. Um, and so I did lots of work experiences, shadowing, um, you know, GPs and hospitals and so on. And, um, you know, meeting, meeting the patients, seeing, the environment and um, seeing how rewarding it could be um, really uh, inspired me um, and it went from there really um, and yeah so I suppose to fast forward for all the sort of GAMSAT stuff and the, you know, the interviews and so on um, I'm now at St George's and I'm halfway through the course. Perfect so it, it does sound like your your heart was originally set on the fact of studying and it sort of just got lost in transition uh, throughout your education but ultimately you, you came back to uh, studying it uh, at the end of the day I, I guess my first question would be then like why medicine you said you you always wanted to pursue it but I guess everybody has a, a different personal answer on what what made you want to study medicine in the first place Sure. Yeah. So um, I suppose uh, and when I was younger, it was something that, um, as I was saying, my, my family was encouraging me to do more. So that's what made me first sort of think, well, could, would this be something I'd want to do? But I suppose after ultimately reflecting, I, at, when I was sort of 18, I was like, I, I don't think this is necessarily me. So I'm going to pursue being a scientist instead. Um, but it was when I was in my mid 20s, I was, you know, I had more life experience. I was more mature. Um, uh, and um, basically what I'd really enjoyed about university sport was helping people to achieve um, better, I suppose, well-being through, you know, sport, exercise, to some degree, nutrition, um, being able to build relationships with lots of different people, getting to work in teams. Um, and then I was, at the same time, I was also missing science, however, and the challenge of, of learning, you know, vast amounts of science and, and, and all that sort of challenge. Um, so when I met those pitch side doctors and we got talking about medicine and um, I guess I realised that I could combine all of these things into one. And then it was ultimately through my work experiences that I realised that, um, you know, ultimately it is helping people. That's why a lot of us want to go into medicine. Um, and this was, uh, you know, this was a way of doing it. And, um, you know, uh, to be honest, you know, it, it, being able to talk to patients, seeing how, um, you know, medicine can improve their lives and so on, that for me has been um, a huge motivator to go into medicine. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I guess going back right to the beginning of your application, when you mentioned volunteering and uh, work experience, what what particular work experience did you undertake um, to aid in your application? So, um, trying to think back. So, I, I did some around school, which were things like, uh, you know, um, uh, going to local hospital. They had like a, a full on work experience day for local local uh, schools. Um, but then when I got older and I was more in my mid 20s, um, what I did was I shadowed a GP. So actually one of the ones I met pitch side <laughs> um, that time. Um, and I also went and so one of the Royal Marsden hospitals which are um, they're specialists in cancer so 
um, I got the chance to do um, a few days work experience with them. So I wasn't just following around the radiologists, but also the radiographers, the healthcare assistants, the nurses. And for me, that was a great chance to see the, the whole picture, the whole multidisciplinary team. Um, and um, I also got to shadow some England rugby medics. Um, and uh, I did some volunteering um, with a patient radio station, which was, uh, that was one of the funnest, to be honest, because essentially it would be a Sunday evening and you, you'd go up to them in bed and, you, you know, you chat to them and you'd be like, come on, do you want to join our bingo show or do you want to request a song? And, you know, sometimes they, you know, they felt tired, they're in pain, but then they would kind of cheer them up a bit. And that for me was so rewarding. Um, so, yeah, that, that was pretty much the work experiences I did. Perfect. So it sounds like you, even though you, you did dive into go into like more of a research degree, it seems like you still got that that work experience and that volunteering to almost give you an idea of what what it would be like to pursue a degree into medicine before you actually so it sounds like you had that that background of like insight before you you didn't just go out on a whim to obviously study medicine i, I guess with, with your application did you just sit the gamsat or did you also sit the ucat or alternatively the the bmat uh, so i decided to focus on gamsat um the the year that I so that so essentially I applied one time I didn't get in so um, I sat again sat twice so the first time I was just below the cutoff for Nottingham um, which was quite gutting um, and so I decided to sit it again uh, also to do a masters um, and uh, yeah and actually that time that I applied. I didn't actually expect to get in, but I got the score I needed um, and it kind of went from there. Um, I, if, to be honest, if I hadn't have got in that round, I would have then sat UCAT, and maybe resat GAMSAT, just to give myself more options. But at the time, I was I was pretty happy with the options I might have through through just sitting the GAMSAT. So, yeah, yeah, I, I've discussed this uh, a few times with a few people, and it's I guess it comes down to the the bottleneck of graduate entry medicine as a whole. Obviously, there's only limited amounts of places, and there's so many applicants nowadays that it's almost you can you pick what you can get at this point. Obviously, with the free admissions exams as well being almost splitting up the universities that you can apply for, mm -hmm. the choices are very limited. Um, so I, I guess with you only sitting the GAMSAT, how, how did you find the GAMSAT as a whole uh, throughout your first and second time? Yeah, um, you know, I won't lie, GAMSAT's not a, it's not a walk in the park. <laughs> it was quite a tough exam. Um, you know, five hours of pure examination time with breaks, um, but, you know, it's essentially an eight-hour day, so you, you turn up quite early in the morning, um, and then you, you do the first two sections, then you go lunch break, and then you do section three. And by section three, you're coming into the afternoon, and, it, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, my brain was turning to sludge by, you know, about two hours into section two, and, yeah. Um, so you come out, of the exam feeling like you've just run like a marathon you know um but it's doable this is the thing you know a lot of people they they they, they you know they hear this so it's quite tough exam and they think oh this sounds impossible and they feel quite overwhelmed and I felt overwhelmed at times but it, it, it's possible it's definitely possible um one of the reasons I actually picked GAMSAT over UCAT in terms of the first one I would tackle was I feel that with GAMSAT you can control the outcome more than you can with UCAT because of that section two, especially where you can you can practice the essays, you can build up the ideas for those essays, and then you can, um, you know, you can you can get books or you can work with friends to sort of assess each other's essays, and that that can really boost your mark in GAMSAT alone. And then sections one and two, even they, I think you can boost your mark more through your prep than maybe you can. You can sometimes sounds like it's it's a little bit of a lottery. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I think those are actually really good positives for the GAMSAT. Yeah, totally. And you, you're not the first person uh, that said that. The The only issue I found with the GAMSAT is the actual material that they require you to study. Obviously, they don't give you a set specification on what you need to know. And with the other aptitude tests, you, you don't really know need to know any content as such. So I, I guess, is there any particular resources you found helpful when revising for the GAMSAT or to to almost knuckle down those key concepts that you needed to know? Sure, yeah. So uh, I think I'll start with section one. So with section one, I think 
well, one of the things, best things you can do is to get the official ace of papers. Uh, you'll get a free half when you register anyway, so uh, don't but don't pay for that one. Um, but yeah, so just going through the the questions yourself, um, and then uh, going through the solutions. Um, of, you know, the the, special, the ace official ones have the solutions. Des O'Neill are a resource provider who um, they also have really great section one materials. I mean, there's lots of really great section one practice questions out there. Um, and some will explain the answers to to those questions, and they're they're, written, they're really invaluable. Um, and I think it's helpful also sometimes to talk through the questions with you know as uh, people in your study group or uh, you know mentor, tutor, whatever, because then you start to really think about the questions where you need to think to answer them in the way that GAMSAT wants. Um, and then with section, well, actually, just to add to that, there's also a book called The 20th Century Book of Essays. And um, the, some of the excerpts you get from that are very similar to what you will get in section one for the verbal reasoning questions. So I also recommend that. And then building your vocabulary through vocabulary.com or using a uh, dictionary app where you can save words you come across you don't, you're not familiar with and then you review them because you, you will come across words you, you're probably not used to. Um, you know, it, I think everyone just needs to build their vocabulary a little bit for that for that section. With section two, um, getting a huge bank of ideas. So um, there's some sort of common themes that tend to come up. Again, ASA don't tell you what they are, which is so annoying, but they are out there. Um, and um, I do list some on my blog. Um, and essentially, what you what I like to do is I used to get like a big A4 paper and say, okay, so for love, um, which could be a theme, and then I would come up with all these ideas. And so on, based on TED Talks, um, things I read on the news. Um, I quite like Big Think. A lot of people like the conversation. So lots and lots of places to get those ideas. And then practicing the actual essays, um, doing at least 20 practice essays. Having a structure can be helpful. A lot of people say you don't need a structure. So I think, to be honest, it's it's figuring out what works. I, th I felt better with a structure. I felt more confident with a structure. So I personally used one. <clears throat> um, and then with section three, I mean, the biggest mistake I think people make is assuming it's like a normal science exam when it's not. My master's science exams weren't as difficult as section three. So, you know, and it's because, you know, the clues in the in the title of the section, which is reasoning, you know, in, in effectively, and I think it's physical sciences and, and so on. So it's about reasoning. Um, and so actually, and and as um, a, lot of, a lot of people probably already know, but just to really like emphasize a lot of the information, practically all the information you need is in the question stem. But having some familiarity with the knowledge and the concepts will uh, hopefully make you interpret the questions faster, essentially. And that's the edge that, that gives you. But yeah, essentially it's a reasoning test, section three. So just it's really important not to over rely on knowledge and revising knowledge, essentially. So yeah, that's what I found helpful. Perfect. Thank you for that. And so I I guess moving on to your your interview stage of your application now, how many interviews did you get throughout your two cycles? Uh, yeah, so for, for the first application, um, I didn't get any because I didn't meet the GAMSAT costs. Okay. <clears throat> um, for the second one, I managed to get interviews for three out of four, so for oh, wow. Swansea, Nottingham and St George's. Wow, so it, it seems like you, you really up your game from the first time you learned from your, I, I wouldn't like to say mistakes, but you almost bettered yourself on the stuff that you didn't do so well on the first time. I guess with your with your free interviews, were they all MMI style? I, I know Swansea is a bit different, mm. but presumably Nottingham and St George's are MMI style. Yeah, so yeah, when I applied, um, St George's were MMI, um, Swansea panel, and Nottingham MMI. I, I believe with the sort of virtual interviews now, that might be a bit different. Yeah. But, but yeah, when I, when I applied, that was how it was. So Yeah. So how did you find the MMI style of um, interview as a whole then? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I, I liked it. <laughs> if, if you can like an interview just because, um, you know, you can, you can study the sort of or prepare for the kind of... Um, the stations that can come up and then as you I felt like as, as I came into a station already from like maybe the brief you've been given or the way it, it's set up when you come in you're like okay I think I know what this is going to be and then you, if you've been preparing you you've got this sort of set idea of what you're going to say or do um so I, I yeah I kind of liked that about MMIs <clears throat> um yeah uh and then with panels um yeah I mean I, 
you know, I, I, I'd done quite a few job interviews before, and I think that that is good prep. And maybe as as grads, we tend to have had more job interviews so far, yeah. up to our application. Um, so I think I think that can be quite helpful. Yeah, I guess traditional interviews are more are more well known. The the MMI style is is when you verge into the you, you've never done this before. So I guess how how did you how did you prepare? for the MMI style of questions? Like, is there any particular resources that you used that you thought were good? Um, so I, uh, yeah, so I used um, the ISC Medical School Interviews book. Yeah. Um, I found that super useful because they go through pretty much every question you could be asked and they give you example, you know, um, example good answers. So that was really useful. Um, I also did a lot of research myself. So um, needing to be up to date on the latest news um, and things like that, um, you know, what's the latest sort of NHS strategy and, and things like this. So going away and sort of researching, doing a lot of Googling, to be honest, I found useful. Um, and then practicing with people was super useful as well. So I found people who were, um, so there was a guy who I was doing my master's with who was also applying to medicine. So we, we had a few times where we met up and we practiced together. I practiced with somebody else I'd met um, and we practiced online. Um but yeah, I also did a mock um, circuit, and um, and I also did a interview weekend course. Um, I'd say it's it's you. Do, I feel like it's not always needed, and obviously that cost me money. Um, but you know, I think if you have the cash and, and you'd like that sort of extra confidence, then then they can be, um, you know, quite helpful as well. But if it's like, and I. I guess you set yourself up in a in an amazing spot with your with your gamsite result in getting those free uh, interview places. So it was more about securing as many places as you could. Uh, obviously, within the second cycle, and obviously you're here, so it must have it must have worked out. I guess the one thing that everybody trips up on with the MMI style is almost the. Oh, what's it called? When you role playing, sorry, mm. the the role playing aspect. So, how did you find the role playing aspect, and did you did you do any specific to prepare for that style of question? Mm, yeah. Um, so, with the role play, I feel like there's a certain there's a limited number of potential role plays you could come across in terms of the scenario. And I picked up on those through the the books. So the, the ISD book, I think, gives some examples. And there's examples online <clears throat> um, and also through the sort of mock, uh, the mock um, MMI circuit I did. There was also, you know, and, and I think with those, I think having sort of a, a strategy in mind is really important. So one that um, is people always talk about is breaking bad news. So there's a certain sort of formula which you can follow, but obviously not to do it robotically. You know, you need to, you know, you need to sort of come into the moment as if it's real and then, and then, um, and be yourself at the same time. So for example, they say that you should, um, you know, um, say, you know, there's something I need to tell you. And then there's like a, there's a warning shot and then there's a pause and then you say, oh, and this, this is what's happened. So, you know, I think as long as you have that formula in your head and then you practice and then you try and get natural at it and actually be, be genuinely, you know, yourself and empathetic and caring as if it's a real scenario. I think that's the, actually really, really key because what they're looking for is to see, are you empathetic? Can you talk to people? Can you reassure? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I would advise and what I found useful for role plays. Perfect. So... It seems like it seems like they're more looking for you knowing the key concepts behind obviously breaking bad news, and if you know the key concepts behind it, you can almost break bad news to anybody as long as you follow that background uh, information. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd be sort of hesitant to say that this is definitely what they're looking for because I've not been an interviewer or obviously an admission tutor of any kind. So, but I, um, yeah, I suppose from my impressions is, um, yeah, effectively, I think those sort of formulas aren't actually required. It's not like they'll necessarily tick off, oh, she did a pause, she did the warning shot, but it's a really good, um, basically, if you have that and you use it, it's it's safe. You know, you could do it a different way, but this way is safe because this has worked mm -hmm. and people have done this and they, they've scored well in that station. So, um, and of course, you can then, of course, use it in real life, which is, you know, kind of the whole point of this, that one day you're going to be doing these things in real life. So, yeah. 
Yeah, perfect. So, so looking back now, is there is there anything you wish you would have known before you began your degree as a med student? Um, I th- I'm just trying to think. I think I, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share a bit of advice I got really early on in the degree, which um, I think has been really invaluable. Um, so, and well, essentially, someone in one of the years above came and talked to us, and they said, "Look, the way." medicine works is um, it's like eating pancakes and you need to eat five pancakes a day and if you forget to eat your five pancakes that means tomorrow you need to eat 10 and if you forget again that means or, or you procrastinate that means the day after that you need to eat 15 and by the end of the week it's become unmanageable so their advice was to make sure you essentially stay on top of your work um, and um, there have been times when I've been quite good at that and in times when I've not been so, quite so good at that and, and I do feel like that advice was absolutely spot on especially for so at Georgia's the first year, they essentially have taken years one and two of a normal five year and sort of made it into one. They do cut out a few bits, but essentially two in one. So it's very intense. And so it is, it's uh, and um, some other courses, I believe, are like that. So, you know, it, with courses like that, you really do need to stay on top of it. Um, so, yeah, I think that is the best advice I got early on in my degree. Um, and I would yeah definitely recommend that to everyone else as well. Perfect. That's real good advice. So obviously you're in your your second year now. You're halfway through your uh, your med degree. Are there any particular like myths or misconceptions that you thought were stigmatized within medical schools before you got there? Um, so sorry, do you mean um, sort of like uh, negative things about med school that turned out to not be true? Or yeah, yeah. So like for example, some people have said like you have to be super smart to get into, into medical school or med, medical school is only for the like prestigious for example mm, yeah okay um yeah that's I mean that's definitely not true um you know there are people from a range of backgrounds and I actually think that that's really you know it's really exciting to be in a, in a group you know in PBL tutorials and everyone's got very different backgrounds you know it just makes it very interesting um and uh yeah so uh, you know you don't need to be from a particular background at all in terms of how smart you need to be, I think it's more important to be to have a good attitude um, and to be a hard worker and to work smart. Um, because, you know, the thing about medicine is, like, obviously there's a degree of, you know, needing good reasoning and intellectual ability because we need to interpret things fast and make decisions. But, um, and that's kind of what GAMSA and UCAT are testing, for example. But Actually, it's just a lot of learning a lot of stuff and learning it well and not getting it wrong. Um, so, you know, I think if anyone's ever insecure about how clever they are or thinking oh, everyone who's at med school must have you know, it's been insanely clever, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a range. And it's just, you know, you, I think if you work hard and you've got in, then it means you have what it takes. And um, just working smart and working hard is going gonna, is gonna to get you to the finish line. Perfect. Thank you. And... I guess moving on to that is you, you mentioned it's such an intense course, St. George's. So how do you find time to manage like extracurriculars, any volunteering on the side with your degree? Obviously from your previous degrees when you're doing volunteering on the side, how have you found time to manage that now? Yeah. Um, so I, I'll, I'll be honest. So I think last year I didn't do the best at this. Um, because I took on a lot of roles. Um, so I was doing some volunteering, I was resurrecting a sports society, a sports club and, and all these types of things. And um, yeah, there were times when I was really quite stressed actually. Um, but I think, but, but, but what I then did was I realized I'd taken on too much. And then I, um, and then I started sort of pulling out of things as, as, in as nice and as good a way as I possibly could. So I'd finish off whatever task I had to do, or I'd commit to it and then say, okay, so I, I don't think I can do any more volunteering for the rest of this year. For example and then I would focus on other things because I think ultimately in terms of managing workload it's really important to remember that the degree comes first yeah. and all these other things are great for building up your CV and your skills and it's good fun but ultimately you have to pass the degree to become a doctor um, so I think um, you know knowing when you've taken on too much is really important being able to sense that um, knowing when to say no or when to pull out of things is really important um, and I think also just being realistic at the start of the year, so saying, okay, I might take on one extra thing to my degree, or I might take on two extra things, um, and then sticking to that is really important. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. And I guess to move on to talk about, obviously, you've been in a, 
a bachelor's degree, so you, you understand the competitiveness of everybody actually fighting for that first class. Um, and with the more you, you've you've almost been in contact with people that want to study the same degree as you uh, in your masters. So, have you found the the competitive aspect from obviously your undergrad in a BSc to medicine now? How how do you, I guess my question is how how's the competitiveness like shifted? If that makes sense. Okay, um, I think honestly, in my um, bachelor's and, and in my master's, I didn't I didn't feel a, a great degree of competitiveness. I don't know if that's just because I I wasn't really in, in, engaged in that sort of uh, competitiveness, but I I just kind of cracked on with my work and uh, and that was it really. Um, I think in terms of medical school, I think um, at sh- uh, I think from my personal experience, it's been really supportive. Um, and um, I suppose more than my bachelor's or my master's, you know, people are sharing resources or oh, check out this, you check out these videos or, oh, guys, I found this really helpful resource for this assignment we've been given. And nobody's asked necessarily. They've just volunteered it on the WhatsApp group or, or the Facebook group, you know, and I think that's really uh, lovely um, to have that sort of sense of community. And we're all just trying to help each other be good doctors at the end of the day and pass. Um so yeah, as, 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 as just to summarise, then I guess in my bachelor's I didn't really feel that there was much competitiveness, mm. but in in medical school it's it's just very supportive. So no, yeah, totally, and I guess it's a, a bit harder for the people that have not not seen the other side of the fence. In that we we only experience the the application side. Would it be put down to you guys have made it now? All you need to do is hit those pass marks, and then ultimately you're all going to come out with the same degree so I guess would you put it down to that or is it just a case of I, I guess you guys have all made it you guys are all there now um yeah uh, I'm not too sure really where, where it comes from maybe maybe you're right maybe it is a sense of well look, we've all got in uh, it's not like uh, you know there's any reason anyone's it's not it's, you know once you're in you're in and as long as you pass like you say you you get to the end and then you qualify and then you and then it continues and um, I, sometimes I think actually some of it is also just um, the culture that you come into straight away in the medical world which is oh hi you're you're in the year below how can I help or oh hey we're in the same class like how can I help um, it's I mean it's everywhere um, you know it's you know, when on placement there will be junior doctors and there will be, um, you know, even consultants saying, how can I help? You know, it's it's throughout the whole of medicine, throughout the whole journey. And, and I suppose that trickles down also to when you first start medical school and that medical school experience. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it's generally sort of a, tr- a true uh, characteristic of the medical world. Um, yeah. Perfect. So I guess moving on to more of like the personal side of medicine is personally what keeps you motivated in such an intense course is medicine yeah um I think for me it's um it's getting to meet patients and talking to patients um getting to see um how so you know as a medical student there's not much you can do for them but actually um sometimes them just getting to talk to you for half an hour for them just you know for them that's that's great and that for them is as helps them by itself and yeah I think just those relationships with patients and getting to help them is, is a huge motivator for me um the other one would be just I, I really love learning and in medicine it's lifelong learning and there's always something uh, challenging to get you know to get your teeth into to learn more about you there will always be an opportunity to improve um it's it's a career with so many different aspects you know, it's it's not just do you understand this concept? You know, have a, have a you know renal tubules function. It's you know, can you talk to a patient about this? Can you can you do this particular clinical skill? So, I think it's just a career with with many different uh, opportunities for for learning. And um, you know, for me that just that just keeps me motivated. Um, you know, and I, I for me this is something that uh, you know it's clicked and it feels right, and I feel a calling to be a doctor. So that that is sort of a, an evergreen motivator to keep studying. Totally amazing. So I I guess on the on the flip side to that, what keeps you motivated in such a long and strenuous course? <laughs> that, sorry. Um yeah, what sorry. What keeps you motivated in such a long and strenuous course and how how do you find time to plan for like self rest and care? Obviously disregarding the 
the the extra curriculars that we talked to, just like finding time for yourself, how hard do you find that, obviously, in a graduate entry course? Mm. Um, so, um, like I said, the first year is very intense uh, at George's, and then um, this, the second year is, is not quite so bad. So I think I think knowing that once I got through the first year, the second year wouldn't be so bad was, was quite helpful. Um, uh, and I suppose um, kind of what, what I was saying before was just sort of being realistic at the start about how much you can really take on and then um, sticking to that, make sure you don't take on too much. Once you feel like you've taken on too much saying, okay, I, I do need to pull out of something. Um, I think, I, you know, it's, so, so it can be difficult. You know, the workload's huge. It's, it's, the workload's a bit much bigger than it was for my master's, for example. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just sort of being uh, mature about it. You know, I think there's a tendency, especially with the type of um, personalities that maybe go into medicine of, you know, I need to be the best, I need to be top of the class, I need to be perfect, I want to be excellent at this. Which, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be excellent, to be a great student, to, be, to become a great doctor, but you just got to be realistic. You know, you're not superhuman, and, you know, I'm not superhuman. It's just, um, yeah, so I think that just trying to remember that self-care is um, still very important and should still be considered a priority along with your studies, I think is really really the key to that yeah totally and I guess it's it's almost stigmatized over Instagram social media and with within like the the scientific community of you have to work these 70 hour weeks just study 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 and these almost these medigrams promoting this uh, this realistic life of 100 hour a week study sessions and mm. I do totally agree with you that you do need to find time nobody's superhuman Nobody can do 100 hours each week of study material. So it's it's finding that time for self-rest and taking care of yourself, which ultimately will put you in a better position later on because you're not going to hit that that inevitable burnout that everybody's mm. going to hit at some point. So I totally agree with that. So I, I, I guess what's your, what's your vision going into the future then? Obviously, you're, you're halfway through your degree now. Where do, where do you see yourself going after post-graduation? Mm, um, I think um, I'm considering uh, doing my foundation training in a different city. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And um, after that, I'm looking to go into sports medicine as a specialty. Um, and I'm sort of figuring out as I go along exactly what route I want to take into it. Um, and yeah, yeah, so I suppose that's my plan for the future. Wow. So it, I feel like it's come it's almost come full circle of your you're getting a job in sports and then it's almost you're wanting to go back to study sports after after you've got your degree yeah yeah so um there, there's like a master's in sports medicine which is part of that specialty training which is which means yet another <laughs> degree which uh, i was like oh oh well you know if, 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 if it's what if it's going to get me to where i need to go okay I'll, I'll do another degree that's fine um but yeah so so yeah that, i suppose it has come full circle and um yeah that's sometimes that's how how life seems to be isn't it so yeah oh yeah perfect so i guess for, for future medical students watching this video do any a golden piece of advice you give to somebody just going through the application process yeah, sure. So um, I think it's really important, firstly, to make sure that um, this is definitely for you, um, because uh, it's um, you know it's 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 a lot of work and it can be stressful. And I think you know the biggest motivator for a lot of people is knowing this is definitely for them. And um, it sounds like sometimes people aren't quite sure um, based on people that have contacted me. Um, so yeah, I think through work experiences, really getting stuck in the volunteering in clinical environments, uh, doing shadowing, and then really reflecting, okay, just, does this really match me? And is this really what I want to do? Um, and then secondly, um, to essentially have a, a strategy. So what I did was I created a sort of big flow diagram and I stuck it up on my wall and it was, okay, so I'm here and I'm gonna get to here. Um, and through that, I had the work experiences, doing GAMSAT, um, doing the interviews and personal statements and so on. And so this, it was effectively like a big, big checklist of what I needed to do and then breaking those down into their own sub checklists of okay to get work experience I need to contact this person I need to you know um, so I think having that strategy and that plan uh, is really important thirdly to 
to, I suppose, just uh, kind of enjoy the process, which I realize can, is easier to say um, than to do. Um, you know, I had many times where I was overwhelmed and like, oh, am I ever going to get in? Um, but, you know, being patient and just sort of um, making sure you fulfill the criteria is really important. And then and then just doing your best, essentially. Um, and then uh, um, just thinking, um, I think also um, to, yeah, to try and have positive support around you. So whether you find other people doing GAMSAT or whether you um, have friends that are also doing this, I think it's really important to have them uh, in that journey as, as sort of positive supports. Or if you don't know anyone else applying, um, you know, friends, family, um, sticking to the really positive people. Um, and then also looking for sort of free quality advice where you can find it. Obviously, you, you can get, you know, courses and, and, you know, pay loads of money for books and stuff. A lot of the time, especially now, a lot of it's out there for free. Um, so try and find it for free um, and then only really pay for it if you need to. That's, um, I think that's all my advice. Yeah. No, yeah, perfect. And I guess finally for, for people starting out their first few days at med school, uh, what would be your take on tip? for those students yeah sure so um i suppose going back to that pancake idea um remembering that if you stay on top of your work and you do a little bit each day and tr um trying not to procrastinate too much then you, you should be fine um uh also um you know uh, i suppose yeah i suppose when like if it's like your first day for example your first week you know just try and relax and um, just realize you've, you, you're here now and, um, you know, try and uh, just get to know people, go to the freshers or the welcome fair, see what, you know, extracurriculars you could do um, so that you've got a sort of balanced sort of work life going on where you've got like something fun to do as well as your work. Um, and, and yeah, I suppose, I suppose just enjoy the journey, um, uh, you know, because now you're in med school, you know. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for that. Again, I just had to say a massive thank you for taking the time out of your out of your day to come speak with me. It's again a Sunday, so thank you for giving up your weekend uh, to come speak with me. I, I guess finally, are there anywhere our viewers can get in contact with you online if they have any questions, etc.? Yeah, sure. So um, I've got a, an Instagram, and the handle is Graduate Medicine Success. Um, and I, I post some advice and tips on there and people are welcome to DM me anytime. I've also got a, a blog where I've, um, I've got some tips and advice as well. And that's www.graduatemedicinesuccess.com. Um, and yeah, I, I think I'm on like, yeah, I'm on like Twitter and stuff like that as well. But I think those are the two main, two main uh, ways to, uh, uh, you know, get in contact with me and, and find me. So, yeah. Perfect. I'll be sure to add that. Thank you for that, Eleanor. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye.